where else would we be than 1 Timothy chapter 3? So find that as quickly as you can in your Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 3, as we continue our study, we come to the end of this third chapter and finally to discover the reason for this letter. What is 1 Timothy all about? Why was it written? And of course, we have referenced this passage uh, numerous times already, so we've already uh, seen the answer to that. But tonight we want to look a little more closely into this great portion of scripture. First Timothy chapter 3, follow along as I read, beginning at verse 14. I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Here we have stated for us in black and white the clear definitive purpose of this letter. If you hadn't figured it out already from the content of the first three chapters, now you know. This letter was written to correct and direct the church. Paul was passionate about the church. He was personally responsible in many ways for the establishment of this church and couldn't bear to see it fall into the hands of false teachers. So he leaves Timothy there in Ephesus to set things in order and then writes him this letter telling him exactly how to do that. As many of you know, one of the things that grieves me and troubles me maybe more than anything is how so many professing Christians are indifferent toward the church. How so many believers today seem to talk about their Christian life and live their Christian life really completely independent of the church. Um, like church just isn't that important. They claim to belong to Christ, but they don't belong to any local body of Christ. And just how disturbing it is to me that that, that has become normal in our day. And you uh, have maybe heard me rant about how incongruous that is, that you think you could belong to Christ and not the body of Christ, as if we could separate the head from the body and be connected to him and committed to him, but not to his people. And if so, you've probably heard my explanation for maybe how that happened or in some part how that happened, how we made such an emphasis a generation ago on having a personal relationship with Jesus and failed to emphasize the other side of that, the, the corporate responsibility side of Christianity. Yes, being a believer means having a personal relationship with Christ, but it also means having a corporate responsibility to the body of Christ. And you can't separate those things any more than you can separate the head from the body, Christ from his church. But in thinking on that, to be fair, I think we have to give the other side of that. If we're completely honest, I think we also have to concede that a lot of the apathy or indifference toward the church is the church's fault. Many Christians see the church as worthless and irrelevant because the churches they see are worthless and irrelevant. Most churches aren't doing what churches are supposed to be doing. Many churches have become obsessed with politics and social issues. Other churches have become enamored with culture and they're trying to engage the culture or redeem the culture or transform the culture. Some churches are just enslaved to their programs. 
whether it's a building program or a Christmas program or a church growth program, but they're just constantly, there's some program that's being promoted. Silly Christians will stay and play in those silly churches. Serious-minded Christians will not. Serious-minded Christians are looking for serious-minded churches if they can find one, if they haven't given up trying to find one. So in other words, I believe Christians will get serious about church when churches get serious about church. Christians will get serious about doing what the Bible says when churches get serious about doing what the Bible says. And at Anchor Bible Church, we aren't claiming to have a corner on that. We aren't claiming to be anywhere close to all that the Bible says we should be. But we are at least serious-minded about that. We're not trying to be cute. We're not trying to appeal to a particular generation or culture. We're not trying to be cool or popular or culturally relevant. We're just trying to be a genuine, legitimate, biblical, true church. Nothing special, just simple. Simply that. Teach the Bible, equip the saints, shepherd the flock, exalt Christ, proclaim the gospel. Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it stupid, simple. To do that, we have to have some priorities. We have to have some objectives that we are serious about, commitments that we have to be committed to and stay committed to, or characteristics that that we want to be true of our church 10 years from now or 100 years from now, and so we're trying to build them into the culture, write them into the DNA of our church right now. Thankfully, they aren't things we had to make up. (laughs) We didn't have to be smart enough to come up with these things, right? Or we wouldn't have. They're here in this letter. They're here, frankly, in this explanation of why Paul wrote this letter. And I want us to see them tonight, the basics, the essentials. These aren't profound things. These aren't next level things. These are very basic foundational things. But they're also things that Paul is having to call this church back to. So obviously there are things we can drift away from if we aren't intentional and careful about staying true to them and glued to them. So I want us to look tonight at the ABCs of Anchor Bible Church. The A, first of all, I would call adhere to Scripture. (laughs) Adhere to Scripture. We must do that. We must stick to Scripture. More exactly, we must adhere to what has been written for our instruction. That's what Scripture is. It's instruction from God that has been written in the form of letters like this one, like 1 Timothy. We have to study them and do what they say. You can see where I'm getting that. Paul says, I hope to come to you before long. You may remember he was just there, just long enough to deal with Hymenaeus and Alexander But then he left, went on to Macedonia, leaving Timothy behind. And so he hopes to return soon, literally with speed, quickly, speedily is the idea. It's uh, actually the Greek word taxi, from which we get taxi, which is kind of ironic. If you've ever tried to take a taxi somewhere, you rarely get there quickly, but that's the idea. So he's saying, my desire is to come there in person as soon as I can, as quickly as I can hail a cab. 
because he knows the situation. He knows the vulnerable situation Timothy's in. He knows the the deteriorating condition of this church. He knows the danger of the false teaching that is taking hold, and so he's really hoping to get there as quickly as he possibly can. And we can understand that when we have something really important to tell somebody, we don't want to we don't want to talk about it on the phone. We don't want to text or email. We want to be there in person, don't we? Face to face. We certainly don't want to send it in a letter, snail mail. And so Paul wanted to do that. He he wanted to be there, hoping to come to you soon. That expresses his strong desire to be there with Timothy and help him with all of this. But knowing the unlikelihood of that and knowing he could be delayed perhaps longer than anticipated and perhaps even indefinitely, he sends this letter instead. Because these things are important. These things can't wait. Timothy needs clear instruction. This church in Ephesus needs clear authoritative instruction. These things are too important to delay any longer. They need them now so he writes. If ever there was such a thing as priority mail, this was priority mail. So we have this letter in our Bible. Aren't we glad? A letter from Paul to Timothy in the church in Ephesus. Because some things can't wait. You say, well, why? What was so urgent? He tells us, I write these things so that you will know, first of all, stop there, you will know, the word know refers to the possession of knowledge or skill or wisdom necessary to accomplish some desired goal. It's not mere intellectual knowledge, but practical knowledge, how-to knowledge that translates into action, translates into proper living. So Paul is writing in lieu of coming. He's writing because he doesn't want Timothy or the church in Ephesus to be unclear or confused or ignorant or misinformed any longer. He wants them to know. To know what? How you ought to conduct yourself. That's the subject matter of this letter. This whole letter is about proper conduct in the church. Not just how you behave in church, don't run, don't talk loud. It's not just how you behave in church or while you're in this building. It's how we're to conduct ourselves as the household of God, as the church of the living God. He says, I don't want you to not know how to do that. I want you to know how to do that. And I want you to know how to do that immediately, right now, without any further delay, by waiting on my arrival. So there are things we need to know. That's the point. There are things every church needs to know. There's a code of conduct for the church And we all need to know what that is. There is such a thing as proper and improper behavior. And Christians need to understand the difference. So that's what this letter is for. This letter, like all the other New Testament letters, contains God-breathed authoritative instruction for the church. How we are to conduct ourselves as Christians who belong to the church. The word conduct refers to our consistent pattern of life, how we behave. It's the idea of walking. I think the old translations, King James has conversation. It's not talking about talking. It's talking about walking, your walk. The word is literally... a to turn hither and thither, to turn here and there. So it's talking about coming and going. It's just talking about your normal routine of life. 
how to do that, how we live, how we behave, how we conduct ourselves. Paul says, I want you to know how to do that. And I'm telling you here how to do that. That's why I've written this letter. And obviously not just so you'll know how one ought to conduct himself, but that you'll actually do it. But you can't know, you can't do what you don't know. So first we have to know. So again, it's a very basic foundational thing, isn't it? And yet it obviously needs to be stated. (laughs) As believers, we have to actually do what the Bible says. We have to know the Scriptures. We have to study these letters that have been written to us and for us, but we have to follow the instructions that they provide. We have to adhere to Scripture. These things weren't written for us to ignore. We have to do them. As churches, as Anchor Bible Church, we have to accept all that these New Testament letters are written to New Testament churches, and so they apply to us. And we have to study them and know them and obey them. In other words, how we conduct ourselves is not primarily a matter of personal interpretation. How we conduct ourselves is not a a matter of personal preference. It's a matter of corporate obedience. We are a church. We are the household of God. We are the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. How we behave is not up to each one of us individually. How we behave is prescribed for us in these letters that have been written for that purpose. We've already seen how practical that can be and even how countercultural some of these things can be. In chapter 2, specific instructions for men, remember verses 1 through 8, and then in chapter 2, verses 9 through 15, specific instruction for women. Not easy things to hear, not popular to do. But that is how we ought to conduct ourselves. The word, by the way, ought, how we ought to conduct ourselves is the word day in Greek, D-E-I. Day means what is necessary, what is proper, what is appropriate, what is right. And so that's what he's driving at. This is what we ought to do. This is what's appropriate to do. This is what's right and proper for us to do. Not always easy things to accept, not easy things to do, but they're right and proper, appropriate, necessary. Or chapter 3, similar deal, the qualifications of elders and, and deacons, which again fit perfectly with the role and responsibility of each of those offices, but again, not easy, not easy to find such qualified people. And yet we have to insist on those qualifications and not detract from them or even add to them. We must adhere to what is written. And there's plenty written, right? Plenty has been written. We have enough instruction to follow. We just need to follow it. In fact, just thinking through Paul's letters, how he gives detailed instruction for men, for women, 1 Timothy 2, uh, for elders, for deacons, 1 Timothy 3, for older men, younger men, older women, younger women, Titus 2, uh, for husbands and wives, Ephesians 5, for parents and children, Ephesians 6, masters, slaves, Ephesians 6, Colossians 3, 1 Timothy 6, 1 Peter 2, for widows, 1 Timothy 5. For the poor, for the rich, 1 Timothy 6, and on and on and on. Conduct, how each 
of us ought to conduct ourselves in the church. That's the key to a good church. Do we understand that? It's, it's not, there's no other secret than that. It's just a matter of obedience. Are we going to do what Scripture says or not? And so that's really the key for us. That will always be the key for Anchor Bible Church. Are we willing, one, to study the Scripture so we know what it says, and then once we know what it says, are we willing to actually do it? And believe me, those two things sound a lot simpler than they are in reality. But that's, that's the A of the ABCs that have to be foundational for our church. And not just for a season, but in season and out of season, right? 2 Timothy 4.2. So the A, adhere to Scripture. Stick to what is written. The B, then, is be the church. Be the church. (laughs) And you see this. The reason there was such a strong sense of urgency in getting this instruction in writing, sent to Timothy as soon as possible, is that the conduct it prescribes is nothing less than the conduct for what ought to be true of the household of God. The church is at stake. The the household of God is at stake. The church of the living God, which is also the pillar and support of the truth. So the truth is at stake. Apparently those things aren't all that important to some people, but to God, (laughs) they are. And that's Paul's point in piling on all these terms is to underscore the profound significance of what the church actually is. No wonder this conduct is so important. Look what we are. Look who we are. The household of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. How anyone could ever think of the church as irrelevant is beyond me. Nothing on planet earth could be more relevant. So look at these terms and get a higher view of the church. The household of God, first of all, oikotheu, God's house or house of God. The term can emphasize both the place and the people of God. A house and a household, and I think both are in view here. The church is God's house. Not the building, but the church is God's house. In the same sense that the Old Testament temple in Jerusalem was God's house, the physical place of God's manifest presence on earth. That's what the temple was. That's what the tabernacle was. Represented the dwelling place of God on earth among his people. And so Paul is saying, now that's the church. That's you. God now dwells on earth among us. We are his house. We are the dwelling place of God. We're the physical manifestation of his invisible presence. That's why the New Testament uses that analogy for believers. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 6.19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? 2 Corinthians 6, 16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, and then he quotes the Old Testament, I will dwell among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So in that sense, we are the house of God or the dwelling place 
of God. But house also implies household. We are God's family living in God's house. Scripture emphasizes that too. Paul in Ephesians 2.19, that that great reality is true even of Gentiles now in Christ. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Galatians 6.10, he says, so then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are what? Of the household of the faith. So that's talking about the people, isn't it? Fellow family members, brothers and sisters in Christ. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You are the people of God. That's what Paul is saying. The household of God, a people for his own possession. So obviously then your conduct matters. Your conduct matters. And listen, this is why we can't play church. You understand? This is why you can't just go to church or attend a church. You must be the church because you are the church. And you are the people of God on earth. You are the dwelling of God on earth, the family of God on earth. And you don't become that or cease to be that by coming in and out of this building. That has nothing to do with it. You are that all the time, and so we ought to live like it all the time. Then not only the household of God, but he adds the church of the living God. Church, we've talked about that, ecclesia, the assembly of called out ones. And that's you, that's each of you. If you belong to Christ, you've been called, called out of darkness into his marvelous light, called out of this world into his kingdom, called to salvation in Christ. And that's why we assemble. That's what's what compels us to to gather together and not neglect the assembling of ourselves together because we are the called out ones and and we're not we're, we're desperate for fellowship, right? We're not like everybody else. What makes us One, our common bond is that common calling, and it's a calling out of this world. And so we're desperate for fellowship with others of like precious faith and calling. We don't fit in out there. We barely fit in in here, but we do. And so we assemble, we gather together as the called out ones. But his emphasis is on the latter part of that, on the living God, the church of the living God. In contrast to the vain idols and dead deities of all the nations that all the unbelievers worship, our God is the living God, the God who lives, the God who has life in himself, the God who is life and gives life, the living God eternal life, no beginning, no end, the eternal living God. And we are his church. We are his called out ones. We belong to him. He has called us into fellowship with himself and with his son. Can you take that for granted? I don't think so. The living God. By the way, fun little Bible study. Get your concordance. Just look it up, every occurrence of where it uses that phrase, the living God. Lots of different verses in lots of different contexts. But in almost every case, it's, it's to make emphatic the contrast between the gods of this world 
the phony baloney deities of the nations and the one true and living God. The creator God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that God, the God of the Bible, the only God, the only true God, the living God. When a biblical text or author wants to emphasize his power, the living God, or his wrath, the living God, or his holiness, the living God, or his omnipresence, the living God, or his omnipotence, the living God, on and on and on. Or the audacity of anyone, especially an uncircumcised Philistine like Goliath, taunting the armies of the... Your God is the living God. You understand that? And you are his people. You. You have to live like it. You have to think like it. That dictates a certain kind of conduct, right, that you ought to follow. So the house and temple and dwelling of God, the family and household and people of God, the church of the living God, and then he adds the pillar and support of the truth. Another very vivid analogy here. And I can't help but think that probably in the back of his mind, because he's been to Ephesus so many times and all those people now are in Ephesus, and right in the middle of Ephesus on top of the hill is what? The great temple of Artemis, Diana. Pliny says, in that great temple, one of the seven wonders of the world, there were 127 columns, 60 feet high. <laughs> massive structure. And you've seen pictures of it. Massive structure and massive pillars that supported it, that beautified it. The church of the living God is the pillar and support of the truth, <laughs> the truth. Such pillars were also prominent features in Solomon's temple. You might remember, in fact, two of them were named in the Old Testament. Joachim, the Lord shall establish, and Boaz, in it is strength and maybe that temple is what was in Paul's mind but either way the imagery is is powerful and vivid like those massive columns the church upholds and supports the truth protects the truth defends the truth exalts the truth displays the beauty of the truth for all to see for all to know That carries some tremendous implications, by the way. One, the beauty and credibility and believability of the truth depends largely on the church. The conduct, the character, the doctrine, the faithfulness of the church. How we live out the truth is what magnifies the truth and shows the transforming power and impact and beauty of the truth. Another implication is this, to the degree that any local church ceases to exalt, proclaim, hold up, live, follow the truth, they cease to be a church. I mean, when Samson knocked out those pillars, what happened to the structure? It fell church supports the truth. If we aren't doing that, we aren't a church. When the truth becomes negotiable, when the truth becomes 
relative, when the truth becomes secondary to culture, opinion, tradition, preference, the truth becomes too controversial. Well, doctrine divides. We don't want to offend anyone. And you're no longer a church. The church is the pillar in support of the truth. If you're not the pillar in support of the truth, you're not the church. George Knight says the term truth here, the truth, definite article, the truth is used of the content of Christianity as the absolute truth. He says to remind the church that it is a structure called to uphold the truth of Christianity is also to remind it that it is a household called to manifest that truth in its conduct and to conform to it. In summary, Timothy and the church will conduct their lives appropriately if they remember that they are the home built and owned by God and indwelt by him as the living one and also remember that they are called on to undergird and hold aloft God's truth in word and deed. That's exactly Paul's point. This is why church matters. This is why we can't profess to be Christians and then be indifferent about church. Church is God's household. The church is God's family. The church is the steward and guardian of the of the truth. So we could say it this way, you're the household of God, behave. You're the church of the living God, beware. You're the pillar in support of the truth. Believe. Be faithful, be bold. Be obedient. Now, to give an example of what he means by the truth and, and what he means by being the pillar and support of the truth, Paul concludes by quoting what we think was an early church confession or possibly even hymn, part of a hymn. But it summarizes our third point, the C, confess Christ. Confess Christ. Obviously, to be a true, faithful church, we have to confess Christ. We have to proclaim Christ, exalt Christ, exalt his person and his work. To be the pillar and support of the truth is at minimum, we would assume, to be faithful in proclaiming the gospel, right? That's the core of the truth we uphold the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, who he is, what he did to bring God's salvation into the world. There's any number of ways, though, that Paul could have said that, right? You're the pillar in support of the truth, so fast forward to 2 Timothy 4, preach the word. Or preach Christ and him crucified. Or don't be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Ways he has said it elsewhere. But here he says it with, with flair. With poetry. I think just to convey the grandeur of the gospel, the, the, the splendor of its subject. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. That is an early church or apostolic confession. Or possibly it even became part of a hymn in the early church. But it summarizes the key elements of the gospel, doesn't it? He introduces it by calling attention, first of all, to its undeniable greatness. Its greatness. Literally, he says, indeed, this is the word order in Greek, indeed, confessedly great, 
or undeniably great is the mystery of godliness. So you have different translations. Some say, without question, great is the mystery. It's the same idea. Without question, the, the mystery of godliness is great. And the word great is mega. Huge. Massive. Extra large in the sense of how important it is, how sublime it is, how profound, how beautiful, how wonderful, how marvelous it is. Great. But then he makes it sound really confusing by calling it the mystery of godliness. You ever wonder what does that mean? What is he, what is, why does he use that phrase? What does that mean? Godliness, first of all, is a very interesting New Testament word, eusebius. It basically means fear or reverence. Fear or reverence. I think, and I've read, so I didn't make this up or come up with it on my own, but other people think, too, there's a connection. Like, this is the New Testament equivalent of the Old Testament fear of the Lord concept that we see in Proverbs and elsewhere. So godliness is living in the fear of the Lord with reverence. Devotion, awe, etc., right? Piety. And so we translate it godliness. But it's this reverence for God that issues forth in a life of devotion to God, piety, holiness, and so on. So it basically summarizes the Christian faith. It basically summarizes the Christian religion. Some Bibles even translate the phrase that way, great is the mystery of our religion. Because that's the idea, that's the sense that it's conveying. Our religion is godliness. The the Christian life, the Christian faith is about godliness, living in the fear of God, honoring God, being devoted to God, right? Seeking to please God. That's godliness. That's how the term is used, by the way, in 2 Timothy 3, 5, speaking of some who hold to a form of godliness but deny its power. The outward form is there, but no inward reality to it, no substance to it. Same idea. So godliness is a way to summarize the Christian faith and what we're all about as the people of God. So the mystery of that. The mystery behind that is what? No. Who? (laughs) He. The mystery of godliness is he who was revealed in the flesh and so on. So get this, by mystery he doesn't mean something we can't know or something that's beyond us to comprehend or understand. He means Something we do now know. We didn't know, but now we do know. That's what the word mystery. Paul uses that word frequently in his letters in the New Testament to distinguish truths that were not revealed in the Old Testament that haven't become become known until the New Testament and the coming of Christ. Things that were hidden from our understanding in the Old Testament. Maybe they were there, you know, but you would have had to have been Jesus to figure them out, right? Which is his conversation on the Emmaus Road, showing himself from all the scriptures. Otherwise, nobody would have known that's what that meant. So the mysteries are those things that were hidden in the Old Testament that have now become known and and revealed in the New Testament in the coming and work of Christ. So the mystery of godliness, listen, is the truth revealed in the New Testament about what it means to be godly. What it means to be the redeemed people of God living in the fear of the Lord. How did that happen? How are sinners godly? How have we become the people of God, the household of God, the church of the living God? That's what the gospel reveals. 
so the mystery of godliness, the mystery of our Christian religion is Christ. Again, there's a a play on words here, possibly a contrast maybe in, in the back of Paul's mind, just as the pillars of the temple were maybe in his mind in verse 15. It's possible that the pagan confession that was well known in Ephesus, great is Artemis of Ephesus. Remember they were saying that in Acts 19 when Paul went there and was preaching Christ and just about disrupted their whole economy because the idol worship factory got shut down and that people came together and said, no, 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 don't despair. Great, is, we all know, great is Artemis of Ephesus. That was a common confession in that pagan culture. And so Paul's phrase sort of parallels that. Right? Both of these are parallels. You think those pillars are impressive? The church is the pillar and support of the truth. You think great is Artemis of the Ephesians? No, great is the mystery of godliness. And what is the mystery of godliness? Christ, the revelation of what God has done for us in Christ. Six lines that summarize that. He who was revealed in the flesh, what's that talking about? His incarnation. God became flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit. That's his resurrection. Divine confirmation that his work on the cross worked. God raised him from the dead. Seen by angels, that could go back to his eternal preexistence before the incarnation, or it could refer to his exaltation afterward. Proclaimed among the nations. That's talking about what happened after his ascension. The, the apostles preached the gospel, didn't they, to the nations. And then believed on in the world is the result of that, the effect of that. And then taken up in glory, which is exactly how his earthly ministry, his, his first advent ended, Acts 1, being taken up into heaven while the disciples we're standing there watching the whole thing. So it's sort of a beautiful, symmetrical, rhythmical summation of the gospel. The story of Christ and his work. The mystery of godliness. So you see how mega, how massive this is, right? Conduct matters because the church matters. The church matters because the truth matters. Truth matters because the gospel matters. The gospel matters because Christ matters. It's all about Christ. We have to adhere to the scripture. We have to be the church. We, we have to confess Christ. And we have to do that faithfully, continually. Realizing that those are just the ABCs. Important. We're not a church if we're not doing those. But they are just basic foundational things. Now if that's true on a, a corporate level, let me just end with this. It's also true on a personal level. Right? Individually. For each of us. For our, for our church... To be and do this. That means I have to be and do this. You have to be and do this. You understand? So what does that look like? How do individual believers uphold the truth, for example? If we're the pillar in support of the truth, how do we do that? Ten things we all have to do. First, we uphold the truth by hearing it. Hearing it. Faith comes by hearing. He who has ears, let him hear. The early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We have to do that. You have to hear the word. Secondly, 
by receiving it. Acts 2, those who received his word, that is Peter's sermon, were baptized, right? They received it. 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul says, we thank God that you received the word of God which you heard from us. So not just hear it, but truly receive it, take it in, welcome it, extend hospitality to it. That's what the word means into your heart and life. Believe it. Thirdly, Ephesians 1, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you have to believe the word. Each one of us, and this isn't as easy as it sounds, is it? To really believe that the Bible is the word of God and is absolutely and always true and right and good. For by meditating on it, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. By memorizing it, thy word have I treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you, right? Hiding God's word in your heart. By studying it. The Bereans, you remember, were commended because they examined the scriptures. Study it. Timothy was to be diligent to handle accurately the word. Study to show thyself approved, the old King James translates it. By obeying it, number seven, obey it. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and do it. You're not blessed if you don't do it. James 1, prove yourselves doers and not hearers only. Eight, by defending it, by defending it, Paul said he was appointed for the defense of the gospel. Jude said we must contend earnestly for the once for all delivered to the saints faith. So we uphold the truth by hearing it, by receiving it, by believing it, by meditating on it, by memorizing it, by studying it, by obeying it, by defending it, by living it. Titus 2, that beautiful statement about adorning the doctrine of God in every respect. As older men and older women, younger men and younger women conform to this conduct that ought to be true of us in the household of God, by so doing we adorn the doctrine of God. We make make truth attractive, appealing, credible, believable, winsome by living it. And then by proclaiming it, sharing it, teaching it, right? As you're going, make disciples, teaching them. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Paul, in praising again the Thessalonian church, For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but everywhere your faith has gone forth. Our church is you. You know, when you you sit around talking about that church, it's you. This church is you. Our church is you. And so it is only as you do these things that we will be doing these things. So do them. Master, master the ABCs of ABC. Adhere to Scripture. Be the church. Don't just come to church. Be the church and confess Christ. And may God's grace and glory be magnified through all of that. Father, what a privilege to be the church of the living God, to be the pillar and support of the truth, to be the household, the family of God. Thank you for the 
clear instruction of your word that shows us how to be that. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit who enables us to be that. But above all, thank you for the work of Christ who has made us that. We marvel at your grace in each of our lives. Individually, we marvel at the gracious work you're doing in our church life corporately. We just pray that it will continue and that all we do would bring honor and glory to him. I pray it in his name. Amen.